Um, some of you guys know I've had some very serious health issues for the last five and a half years, and I've been very sick. Um, it's been a battle, just one thing after another, just as one thing resolves, the next thing comes along, and it's, it's been very hard. Um, it got to the point this earlier this year that I had to quit my job because I couldn't keep working. I had to focus on resting and getting healthy. Um, so it's, uh, it's been a very long battle, <laughs> and it's been very tiring. But one, one of the diagnoses that I had was a gluten allergy, and it was bad enough that I knew within a couple minutes if something had gluten in it. It was very quick, and it was very um, significant. <laughs> there was no doubt. And one of the things that's been so hard is I have not been able to take communion corporately for five years because most places don't offer a gluten-free communion. So if I wanted to take communion, I had to do it at home. And so during this time when the Holy Spirit was ministering to me, I felt this righteous anger rise up in me at the enemy for everything that he had stolen over all of these years. And I just sat out loud. I said, enough is enough is enough. I said, you can't do this to me anymore. And... <laughs> So I walked over to the other side of the room to where communion was. And I took communion. That was my act of faith. And I did not react. And I took communion last week. And I did not react. And I'm going to take it today. And I am not going to react. Hallelujah. That is awesome. Um, and it's a powerful testimony because, you know, I, I, I hear lots of people going, well, why don't we see more people come out of wheelchairs or more blind eyes and deaf ears? You know, things like um, being allergic to gluten and having allergies to other things um, has become an epidemic all over the world. And I believe that God wants to heal people of everything. I believe that it's his will to heal. But I believe that he is... You know, I don't, when I, I guess what I'm saying is when I come to church in here, I don't see a lot of people in wheelchairs or a lot of people that are blind or deaf. And I'm not saying that he doesn't heal them, but a lot of people struggle with allergies. Amen. A lot of people struggle with back pain. Amen. A lot of people struggle with a lot of things. So when the other side attacks us and goes, well, those aren't really big miracles and maybe they just didn't have that pain. That is absurd and ludicrous. Why would God want to not deal with the issues that are plaguing us in great numbers um, even now more so than ever. So the idea that someone would get healed of a gluten allergy, anybody who has that or has had it and has been healed of it knows that you have to, in many ways, rearrange your life around that. So um, praise the Lord for that healing. Um, we've actually had other people in our church who have also been healed of gluten. So this is becoming like a wave of healing of gluten. So it's, it is awesome. just want to say that it's getting easier to get out there and pray for people. Mostly the Lord's been leading me to pray for people on motorcycles. And it just, sudden, I just do it. But my biggest prayer I've been wanting to share is a while ago, my friend Adele, who had breast cancer, is now cancer-free. I prayed over her from head to toe, and she's cancer-free, and we're going to keep it that way. So just got to step out in faith and do it. Amen. Awesome. See, this is the reason that we do these things is because people, when they hear the big C word or, you know, again, something like, well, you have this allergy, it'll be with you the rest of your life. Um, we serve a God that's so much bigger than that. And I just want to say that these are the stories that we need to tell because so many churches believe that that stuff has all passed away, that God doesn't move that way anymore. These testimonies, these should be daily, weekly, monthly. We should be hearing about these things all the time. Amen. And the more that we talk about them, it's not just going to be seven mountains or other quote unquote Pentecostal charismatic churches or theologies that are going to believe it. It's just Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if he healed 2,000 years ago, he's still healing today. Amen. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Come on up. Thank you. All right. I didn't remember it was testimony Sunday, so I didn't rehearse this, so please bear with me. 
A family friend, his grandmother ended up in the hospital a few weeks ago, and they diagnosed her with acute myeloid leukemia. I butchered it, um, but I refused to Google it because I didn't want that report. I only want God's. <laughs> so the report kept getting worse and worse and worse. First it was that, and then it was kidney failure, and then it was no immune system, and infections, and then to top it off, they got her a COVID positive test. <laughs> of course. And many of you know what my family has been through the last year or so with my mom. There was no retesting her for COVID. We were isolated from her. So I was upset with all these diagnoses that they gave my family friend. But I got really, really mad when it turned into COVID. So I started rebuking that immediately. A couple hours later, they retested her. It came back negative. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. So, because I knew I had to get in there. I knew I had to pray over her. I had to lay my hands on her because, you know, the Great Commission. That's my job. So, I keep bugging my friend. I'm like, when can I go see her? When can I go see her? When can I go see her? Finally, I got to go see her on Sunday. It was a couple of weeks ago. And I'm sitting in church on Sunday. And I'm like, okay, how can I kind of get out of this? Because I'm really uncomfortable and I don't want to you know, have to pray in front of the whole family and stuff. So I'm like, okay, well, what about, like, a healing cloth? You know, I could just, like, kind of stick it in the blankets, and then I'll have faith for when she touches it, that she'll get healed, and, you know, I can just believe for that. Well, I didn't bring a cloth. <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, what did I bring? I brought my hands. So I've been listening to Carly and Ashley Teredes during the week, and I've heard Andrew Womack say this a million times, like, well, what can you believe for? God will meet you there. He'll meet you where your faith is. But when I heard Carly and Ashley Terada say it, like, light bulb went off. I'm like, all right, I can believe that if Josh prays over my hands and anoints them, because God already did, but if he'll pray over them and I go lay hands on her, she'll get healed. I'm like, okay. So service comes to a close, and by the grace of God, there was about a two-minute time frame before Josh had to go from this thing to that thing, and he happened to walk past me, and I asked him to pray for me. And, like, not a super fancy prayer, just a regular old, good old-fashioned prayer. And then I was like, wait, Josh, come back. Pray over my hands. So he comes back, like, 20-second prayer. It's done. I can believe for that. So I'm really excited. We go to the hospital. I have to pray over her in front of the whole family. <laughs> but I did. And the, I love this family dearly. They don't know about the gifts of the spirit and healing and all of this fun stuff that we are blessed to know about. So I have to try to, like, teach them during this prayer. So it was not a fancy prayer by any means, but I just asked the grandma to be in agreement with me and to let me pray over her. And I just referenced, you know, like, Lord, we know your will. It was your will 2,000 years ago for us to be healed. We never have to question your will because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I just released the power of God into her body. And almost immediately, we're ushered out of the room by the nurses. But one of the family members who was in that room said, I felt God. Like, I felt God, too. <laughs> um, so the report the next day was, well, first of all, we don't have our COVID positive test. They took her off oxygen for the pneumonia she had. They took her off the oxygen. Uh, she is no longer confused. They are going from dialysis every day to three days a week. And there's no adverse side effects of the chemotherapy. So glory to God, she's coming home. Awesome. Ooh, <laughs> this is good. This is our God, my brothers and sisters. And this is actually what we're going to be talking about today is just um, 
this oppor- th- what was just stated about walking through these doors when they're given to us. Because, you know, the problem is, and I think most of us would agree to this, that we can look over our daily and weekly lives and know immediately when the Lord opens the door. But what's always our problem? Oh, I don't know. Do I step through it? I don't know. Am I going to, you know, are they going to look down on me? I mean, even Chelsea was sharing about that. Like, you know, the, the prayer cloth is the easier way to go. And you know what? I honestly believe, and, and again, I'm, I don't make theologies and doctrines out of this stuff. I mean, we very clearly, if you read the book of Acts, it says that people were t- taking um, claws and handkerchiefs from Paul and throwing it on sick people. Um, but I believe that God honors the hard. When it is difficult to be able to stand and pray in front of a room full of people that may be unbelievers or to step out in faith and going, you know what, I don't know, is this person going to be received? The bottom line is it's not your job whether the person receives healing or not. It's not your job whether the person receives the Lord or not. It's just your job in that moment when your, when your heart starts beating a little bit faster and you know that every part of the Holy Spirit in the side of you is basically doing this. The Bible says, when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And the line before it is, today, when you hear his voice, meaning you should expect to hear it every single day. Amen. So these are great testimonies of people acting out on their faith. And God honors our faith. We learned that last week. He's already done everything by grace, but he moves into this dimension, into this realm through our faith. These are great testimonies. Can we give the Lord a hand for all of the healing? Okay, since there were so many, I won't talk so long today. Um, it's, how many of you know that sometimes God can speak, uh, give somebody something to that, that they may pass on to you, whether it's a teaching, whether it's a word, and it may be something that they thought it was for something, but then it becomes something else. Like there's times, uh, in, this, in this case, my brother sent me something uh, from a podcast that he was watching, and he's like, oh man, this guy, he just really laid into this and laid into this, and it was so good. And it was, but then the Lord started stirring my heart um, about something else. And I want to share that with you guys because we've been talking about in here that Jesus' return is imminent. Amen? Um, We talked about in here, and again, I know different people have different interpretations of Revelation, but um, the only thing that matters is my interpretation because I have the mic. Just teasing. But I had mentioned about how the red heifers that were raised in Texas are now over in Israel. Again, I'm not saying that means Jesus is returning, but that's a sign because the red heifers are needed to be used to reinstitute sacrifices over in Israel. I've instructed everybody in here, yes, the world will get darker, but you should not be paying attention to what's going on in our government if you want to know the signs of the times. Keep your eyes on the Middle East. I'm not saying that you can't, under, can't see that the fact that, you know, the devil's playground practically these days is America with all the woke agenda and all that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, if you want to know how close we're getting to the end, keep your eyes on Israel. And so I had another friend send something to me this week that's talking about that there's this certain rabbi that at the beginning of the year, he's calling all Jews that are spread out everywhere to come back to Israel because he believes that because of the state of the current government that's going on in Israel, that now more than ever, Messiah's return is imminent. Now, I'm not talking about the return of our Messiah. I'm talking about where the Antichrist is going to show up on the scene. So you have to pay attention to these things. But we did already did a teaching on Revelation, so I'm not teaching on that. But here's what the Lord spoke to me. He said, you're talking about oneness and reality. That's our theme this year. And you're giving people the deep things that I'm showing for you, and you're being obedient in that. But this is what I heard the Lord say. If you really believe my return is as close as you say it is, then what is the priority? And this is what he showed me the priority is. Go ahead and go to the next slide. We need to be all about the harvest in these last days. 
There are a lot, and I repeat a lot, and this is not judgment on people's hearts. This is what I see in the world in my everyday life, and I'm a pastor, so I'm not even really in the world that much, as much as you all are. Um, You know, Joe mentioned that he's blessed to have this job, um, but he's used to being a missionary where he gets to go around and preach and minister to people, but now he's in a job where he's working with some pretty rugged guys. Most of you have jobs in the secular world and realize that you probably, most of you don't work with a bunch of Christians, amen? So there are a lot, and I'm going to say it again, there are a lot of people that are going to hell. A lot. So if we really believe that Jesus' return is imminent, should the last harvest Should that not be our priority? And now I'm not talking about throwing discipleship out and moving 100% into evangelism. But I believe that in this season, worldwide in the church, but even more specific vision for Seven Mountains is we need to be about lost people. And I'm not saying some of you may be. Some of you may be in your jobs witnessing every day and praise the Lord. Then you got it before I did. Um, It's more difficult for me because as a pastor, 90% of my job is usually helping all people who are already believers through struggles with different things. Um, Sometimes I'm able to help unbelievers that just call me because they just think pastors know it all. Um, I don't. Uh, That's why I have to rely on the Holy Spirit. But most of the people that I deal with my job are already believers. When we went through our pruning period here at Seven Mountains Church and we got down to about 30 people and then COVID hit, we almost tripled during that time. And that's a huge thing to celebrate. And if you came during that time, I just want to tell you how glad I am that you are here. Uh, Because I'm about to make another statement that may sound like I'm not glad that you're here. So I want to say this first. I'm glad that you're here. But the vast majority, I'm talking about probably 95% of the people that came to this church during COVID that grew us between an average of 30 people every week to an average of anywhere between 75 and 90 people every week were mostly people who were already believers. Now, that's good. And again, that's why I said, I'm glad you're here. But churches can, can and should grow. I mean, because most of the people that came here said, look, our church isn't teaching truth anymore, or they're caving on all this woke stuff. Or, you know, I had people that come here that said my pastor would not give me a religious exemption so that I could get out of getting the jab. And they just said, basically, it's none of our business, or we want to remain neutral on this subject. That's not neutrality. You just picked a side. And so I'm glad for all of the people that came. And, you know, I'm not writing religious exemptions so I can entice people to come in. I'm not about sheep stealing. I want people to come where where truth is being preached. And so I still want to pick up already believers. But we should be growing by the vast number of people about new people who are being born again, coming out of darkness and being translated into his marvelous light. Amen. And again, the majority of the people that came over were already saved. So what I would like to do, and and this is what I believe. I believe God works in seasons and cycles. I believe that he needed to get us from that 75 to 90 mark. And then we started putting things in like relationship university, healing university. Uh, Christine Rosenwinkel teaches the the voice of God on Sunday nights. Uh, We have the men's group now that there a lot of foundation is being laid and a lot of deeper things are being laid. So I really believe that the time is now, again, not that we'll not take on other believers that just may be coming from other places. Maybe some people have just been like not, They've just been upset with how churches are being handled, and they find us great. But I believe in this specific season that we're going after the last harvest. I want to see people coming into this church that do not know the Lord. Or maybe they're at the very least agnostic and they're searching for something greater because as this world gets darker, people are going to latch on to two things. They're either going to latch on to Jesus or something that the world has to offer. Amen? And you know what? The world will offer people the advantage of coddling people. And I'm not saying that our Lord doesn't help us. Even the the Holy Spirit is our comforter. He's our helper. He's our lawyer. Is literally the word parakletos is the one who stands in court for you. 
But the world life is easy. I see people posting on Facebook all the time about how we need to acknowledge people's emotions. And emotions are part of being human, and we need to celebrate our humanness. That is baloney. Because there are no humans on this planet that are not fallen. So the state of a human being's natural state without Christ is fallenness. Our emotions are fallen. Our wills are fallen. You could be a, try to be a quote-unquote good person this whole life, life but without Christ, you got a one-way ticket down. And nobody will tell people that. Well, I'm a good person. I stick up for this. It doesn't matter if you're a good person. It matters is do you know Christ? And so... What I want to invite us all to do, and I'm going to try to do a better job. How many of you know that repentance begins at the house of the Lord? And sometimes, uh, even though I know that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, when I talk about the house of the Lord in this context, I'm talking about this house. And um, this house is run by our watchmen, which is our leadership team. And this house is run by me. And so repentance has to start there. And again, that doesn't mean that we've been doing anything wrong, but start to recognize from the Lord that if we really believe that Jesus' return is imminent, it's time to go after the lost like nobody's business. And that doesn't mean you have to scare people. A perfect example of going after the lost was an event that was held yesterday. They had trunk or treat at Yorkville Christian High School. Now, I know some of you are like, well, you know, we're not supposed to celebrate Halloween. Again, you know what? That's your business. We were not out there uh, making seances to Satan. We were ministering to families that were bringing their kids around asking for candy. You know, if I would have lived in Jesus' day, and I believe that, that Paul did this because Paul said, become all things to all people. If Paul could win one more person to Christ, he would have went to Zeus's temple and ate steak that was offered to him. Thank you for those two amens. The rest of you should have amen because Paul would have done anything if it won one more person to Christ. That doesn't mean you sacrifice your integrity. That doesn't mean anything else. It means that if the world, and I think that there was over 700 people at this thing, if the world is out there, that's where we're supposed to be. Um, We offered, I mean, we offered candy and then we offered prayer. And out of all of those people, two people took us up on prayer. But you know what? We were able to put cards in with the candy and, you know, and said, hey, come check us out sometime. Every little bit of effort helps. And it's not about growing seven mountains. But you are not here just to feed. You are here to love on the people, especially if you see visitors here today, you better be loving on them like crazy, whether they're born again or not. We're raising up a family of people who believe in the kingdom of heaven. And I want to show you real quickly because, praise the Lord, we had so many testimonies that took up a lot of time, that this is something that the Lord showed me. And I'm going to make this statement, but I'm going to qualify it. Is that people tend to get on one side or the other. Well, we need to be all about evangelism. And then the people that don't want to be about evangelism are like, yeah, but what about discipleship? And then people are get all into discipleship. And then people are like, well, that's great. You know, we've got these super spiritual people all at our church, but we're not winning any lost people. So we can tend to get off on the ditch on both sides. But here's the deal. Um, this is just my opinion. But again, I'm the one with the microphone. I am so tired of hearing people go, we need to be like the church in Acts. The church in Acts, if you truly believe that we should be like the church in Acts, then every single one of you needs to sell all of your belongings and give it to us watchmen. Yeah, Larry, amen, he's a watchman. (laughs) And then we decide what to do with all of your stuff that you gave us because now it's in the hands of the Lord. If you believe that we should be like the original church in Acts, then we need to buy some land and build a commune and just basically keep to ourselves. And then when we win other people of Christ, invite them out there. And then we just take care of, and the most important people that we take care of is widows and orphans. Because James said, pure and undefiled religion is this, that we take care of widows and orphans. So when people make these grandiose statements of we need to be like the church in Acts, or people tell me all the time, our church is like the church in Acts, I have never found one church that actually operated that way. 
And that's a nice cliched saying, but the bottom line is our church should be relevant in whatever time period we're in. And if you have to tell people that they got to sell all of their belongings and give it to everybody here, I'm pretty sure some of you might have a problem with that. And it's okay because that's not what the culture is today. So we should be figuring out a way to infiltrate culture in order to bring people the kingdom. Now, we're still going to meet here every week, and we still offer things during the week, but here's the bottom line. When it comes to discipleship, back then, people didn't have the Bible, right? And really, if you want to be honest, up until about two or 300 years ago, only rich, upper-class people could read, and everybody else had to trust that their pastor was telling them the truth that was in the Bible because they couldn't read it for themselves or they didn't even own one. So the idea that we have the finished Bible and we have the ability to look at it and read it whenever we want, that should be a huge accomplishment. Most of you have probably the version app on your phone, and you have 60 different translations of the Bible. So when I talk about discipleship versus evangelism, here's the deal. I'm still going to teach you every week, and we still offer teaching uh, all throughout the week on healing, on relationships. The men's group is going through foundational stuff. Like I said, Christine is teaching the voice of God. There's still going to be teaching going on. But I'm telling you, in regards to balance, we are on discipleship overload. And some people are like, is that a bad thing? If, it's, if, it, if it cuts into evangelism, you bet it is. Because how many of you know that Jesus taught his disciples for three and a half years? Three and a half years. Most of us have been sitting under the word for 20 plus years. Three and a half years, these guys changed the planet. But see, people don't understand discipleship today because, to be quite honest, most people expect their pastor to give them a buffet on Sunday to last them till next Sunday. Do you understand that with the invention of the internet, you have the ability to feed yourselves all week long? And if you're not taking advantage of that, that's your problem. And I'm not mad at you, but the idea that it is my job, and and I'm repenting because I've fallen into this because I'm like, Lord, what deep revelations can I give them next week? And he'll download them to me. But the bottom line is there is so much teaching through podcasts and YouTube and everything like that. You guys can get all of the Revelation third heaven experiences that you need. So Sunday mornings are going to be about mobilizing all of you super spiritual filled up people to go out there and start destroying the darkness. Because I'm not going to give you great revelations anymore. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you a list of teachers that you can choose to watch during the week. And if you choose not to watch it, like my mom always said to me, you will have as much Jesus as you want. Well, Pastor, you don't understand I'm really busy. Well, I know you're really busy, but I'm sure you have some time before work and some time after work or after your kids go to bed. The question is, what do you choose to do with that time? And this isn't condemnation. I I always have to be rebuked first before I pass on the rebuke. But mine's, uh, in the same way I receive the rebuke with grace, I try to sprinkle grace on what I'm giving you guys. But I'm telling you, this is what the Lord is showing me. If we're so close to the end, we need to stop just getting filled and filled and filled and filled with more knowledge and more things. And, And I'm not saying that one, you throw out one to embrace the other. But how much revelation do we need to know that the time is short and people are going to hell? And we have the ability to bring them out of that through the power of Jesus Christ. But he's not going to sovereignly do it. He uses people. We've been learning about that. One of the greatest foolishness is things that people teach in the body of Christ is that God is just sovereign and he's just going to pick and choose. Do I believe that nobody tells God what to do? You bet. God is number one. He is the big G-O-D. But if God is just sovereignly doing anything, wouldn't the log- or sovereignly controlling everything, wouldn't the logical conclusion for us to just get out of God's way and do nothing? That's where my mind goes. But Jesus didn't set it up that way. He replicated himself to 12 and then to 70 and then so on and so forth, and here we are. We're to be Jesus in the earth. 
And I'm going to show you real quick with some scriptures. Okay, Matthew 9, 35 through 36. Again, this is what the Greek translation inserted. Then Jesus went about all cities and villages, teaching in their churches. I put synagogues, but again, okay, let's get into modern culture here. Yes, I know there's still synagogues today, but basically it was saying, you know, Jesus, were, he went to where all the Christians were gathering or more, or he was a Jew and he went to all the Jews were gathering, but I'm trying to relate this to today. So he taught in churches or synagogues. He proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. That's what we're proclaiming, right? As he is, so are we in this world. Pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's preaching the kingdom. And it says, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. It's so funny because our churches today really like the first part. Oh yeah, we should be preaching the kingdom. We should be preaching Jesus. Well, it also says that he healed every sickness and every disease. Oh yeah, we don't do that part anymore. And if we really believe that, you wouldn't have had these testimonies today. The problem is, is we carved out Jesus's ministry and two thirds of his ministry was healing and casting out demons. And we just took the one third part, which is the preaching. We're supposed to be doing all of it. Amen. It says, but when Jesus saw multitudes of people, he was moved in his inner being with compassion because they were divided, cast away and fleshly. Basically, they are wandering sheep with no lead shepherd who loves them. Do you see what's going on in the world today? People are crying out, whether they know it or not, for a Messiah because there is a lot of disunity going on. And people are thriving on the disunity, the skin color, the, you know, um, 68 different genders and all of that kind of stuff, which, if, you know, just so you guys know, there's only two. Okay. Okay. So we're disjointed and divided, which is why I know without a doubt it's going to be so easy when the Antichrist comes on the scene to pull all these people together. So they're wandering sheep with no lead shepherd who loves them. Next verse. Then Jesus said to his disciples, so this is right after he healed people, he gave them the gospel. And then he saw the multitude. So many times you got to look at things in context. So right after this, he saw the multitude. He's got all this compassion. I believe he's got all this compassion because he's like, how am I going to reach all these people? I'm only here for three and a half years. So after he says this, he says, listen, this statement is true. The harvest field is vast in number. However, the ones willing to work the field are few in number. That was going on that day, and it's a prophetic statement of what's going on today. Most people want Jesus for their own punch ticket out of hell, but how many are saying, I am a bondservant of Jesus Christ? You know, Paul identified himself as an apostle, which a lot of people like titles today. I've been to a lot of churches where everybody's got a title. People insist on calling me Pastor Josh, which I appreciate, and I believe that there is authority and honor bestowed on that. But if you just called me Josh, it's not going to offend me because I'm not big on titles. But do you know that right after Paul said, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ, it may have sounded haughty, except the very next line he says, and a bond servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. So apostle wasn't a way to prop himself up. He's saying, if I'm an apostle, I'm a slave of Jesus. So he says, the ones willing to work the field are few in number. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest. There's a title there. They're Lord of the harvest. That he would send out willing workers into his harvest. It's not our harvest. It's his. But we're the ones that have to go out in the work. He didn't say, pray that God would sovereignly move along the harvest and just cause people to be born again. He said, the workers are few. Pray that more laborers will go. Now, he said it to the apostles. He's not telling people who are unwilling to go to pray that other people will go. He was telling people who were already going to pray. Because some people are like, well, I'm just not supposed to go out and, and proclaim the gospel and talk to people. My job's just to pray. I just want to tell you that's wrong. 
You can pray, but everyone is called to proclaim the gospel. I'm not talking about the office of a preacher or a teacher or an evangelist or anything like that. Everyone on this planet is called to proclaim the kingdom. So look at the order. What does Jesus do? Look what I'm doing over here, guys. Proclaiming the kingdom, healing the sick, healing diseases, every single one, every single time. And then he says, man, look at all these people. I can't do all of this on my own. We need laborers to go into the field. And he didn't say we need laborers to go into the field to just get people born again. He's saying we need laborers to go into the field to preach and proclaim the gospel. We need laborers to go into the field to heal sicknesses and diseases. And and I'm not going into the whole teaching that Jesus is perfect theology. We've already established that the word sozo does not just limit it to heaven someday. It means healing. By his wounds we were healed. Iaomai. That Greek word is physical healing. In Isaiah, by his wounds we are healed. That word is rapha, which means physical healing. It's literally one of God's names. Jehovah Rapha, the healing God or the God who heals. Okay, so Jesus says, look at me, see what I'm doing. Guys, you guys need to be doing this and also pray that other people are doing this. Then we go to the very next chapter. It's recorded in Luke 9 and 10, but if we're following in Matthew, this is what it says. I'm just kind of summing things up. It says, Jesus commissions the first willing workers, the 12, to work God's harvest field. It says that he gave them power and he gave them instruction. Proclaim, heal, cast out demons, Cleanse lepers, raise the dead. That commission is on your life today because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And why did we feel that Jesus modeled some things but not others? It's like a smorgasbord gospel today. Oh, no, we're supposed to proclaim. We're supposed to tell people about Jesus, but we're not supposed to heal people and cast out demons and raise people from the dead. Where is that written? How many of you know that discipleship is complete replication of the other person. Jesus was not trying to get a watered-down version of himself into the 12, and then the 12 give an even more watered-down version to the 70, and the 70 to give a completely watered-down version to the rest of us over 2,000 years. It's become watered-down because we've stopped believing it. So he says, he commissions them and he tells them, preach the kingdom, heal sickness, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, raise the dead. He later, if you look in Luke, he commissions 70 more. And then in each gospel and the book of Acts, he commissions all believers to do the same thing because discipleship is replicating yourself and the Holy Spirit gives you power to execute the entire mission. The entire mission, not the partial mention. Well, I told them about Jesus, it's now up to them. We are supposed to not just tell people about Jesus. We are to be Jesus. The reason that we've carved out just preaching the kingdom is because that part's easy. We can just go, oh, no, you just need Jesus for heaven someday. Instead of going, hey, I saw that you were limping there. Can I pray for you? And then you manifest the power of God. And then they're more likely to listen to you when you want to tell them about the God that they cannot see. Because the God that they cannot see just healed their leg. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. You guys can look at all these scriptures later. But if you're confused of, well, we just need discipleship. I just don't know enough to go out here. Here is a five-minute crash course. Go uh, go, go ahead and go back because I'm going to go through this. 1 John 4, 17. In that passage, it says, as he is, so are we in this world. That's it. What is discipleship like? It's you being Jesus in the world. Now, the problem is most people are like, well, I don't really know everything about Jesus. Great. There's this invention. It was called the Bible. And there's this great section called the Gospels. And you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John over over and 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 over again and ask the Holy Spirit to show you who Jesus is. And then if you're like, great. Now that I know about Jesus, how am I supposed to be carrying out? Well, there's this great book after John called the book of Acts or the Acts of the Apostles. And you actually see what the first generation of people did after Jesus. Interesting enough, they did the same things that Jesus did. 
So you see what Jesus did and who he is. You see that the apostles understood that they were Jesus in the earth. Why would that be any different than for us today? But you have theology and doctrine that tell you those things have passed away and Jesus doesn't do these things anymore. Or if he does, it's purely by his sovereign will, except the unfortunate thing is he never operated that way before. The new covenant, which is the covenant you are in, he always worked through people, starting with his son, then into the apostles. And the bottom line is, if you go back to the Old Testament, he worked through people too. Do you think that God would have consumed the altar if Elijah didn't pray? You better believe he would not have. Because if God is painting a picture of his sovereignty just moving without any participation on our end, then again, my posture is, he knows better than I do. I'm just going to get out of his way. I'm not going to pray anymore. I'm not going to evangelize anymore because I'll probably just mess that up. But God brings forth his kingdom in the earth through people. And I'm sorry if that's like, man, that just feels like a lot of pressure. That's just the way that it is. You can take it up to him when you get there someday. It's the way that he set it up. Okay, so as he is, so are we in this world. If you're visiting today, that's actually the theme of our church. Why? Because you need to understand you're just not supposed to preach Jesus. You're supposed to be Jesus. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. For some people that meet you, you may be the only Jesus that they ever meet in this world. John 14, 12 says, believers will do the very works that I do, and yes, even greater, because I go to the Father. It does not say the disciples. It does not say the apostles. It says believers. How many believers we got in here? You are supposed to be healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons. We don't have any lepers. We got a lot of people COVID. Touch them if they give you permission. Don't start anything. But I'm just saying, do you believe that COVID is going to infect you? Or do you believe that when you touch COVID, it dies? And some people may go, well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor, but I know you were sick last year. How many of you know Pastor Josh misses it sometimes? And all the people said, ouch. We miss it sometimes. You, you, those of you who are born again, did you ever sin after you were born again? Uh-huh. That's not because that we're just sinners saved by grace. It's because the old mentality, the old man, the old system of this world tried to remind you of who you were before and you forgot who you are today. I'm so tired of people trying to resurrect the law today. Everything's been done by grace. If you think you got to do hoops, you got to like, you know, fast for 10 days before God's going to go, you know what, you just don't look sickly enough. You need to lose some more weight and you need to, you know, put on some sackcloth and ashes because I'm just not impressed. That's ridiculous. You fast and pray because that blocks out the things of this world and you are honed in under the things of the kingdom. I gotta go. Okay. Colossians 1.27. Again, all these scriptures are as laying out is as Jesus is, so are you in this world. That was John, 1 John 4.17. John 14.12. You will do the things that he did in greater. People are like, what's the greater? Who cares what the greater is until you've raised like five people from the dead? Then we'll start talking to you about what greater is. I mean, if you just did what Jesus did, that would be huge. Colossians 1.27 says, The mystery hidden from the ages is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If he's in you and you're supposed to be dead to your flesh, then the only identity you have on this plane is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are Christ in the earth. You're not Jesus of Nazareth, but you are the Christ in the earth. This is not blasphemy because in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And if you look up the word imitate, it means to replicate perfectly. Now, people are like, well, I know Paul couldn't have walked perfectly. What is he saying? He's saying as he walks in this earth because the spirit of Christ is in him, that when, since some of these people have never seen Jesus in the flesh, the closest representation to them, Paul is saying, is look how I conduct my life. I'm trying to be as much like Jesus as possible. 
And then if that didn't set the bar high enough, Ephesians 5.1 says, be imitators of God. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, you are to be imitators of God himself. I don't know if it says that. Well, while I'm talking, get on your phones and get in your Bibles and look at Ephesians 5, verse 1. It says, be imitators of God. So that is a crash course in discipleship. Well, yeah, but pastor, what about this? What about this? Uh Uh-uh. Behold Jesus. Be Jesus. That's discipleship. Now, the part that may be difficult is saying, I don't really know who Jesus is. But see, that's where I'm going back to the point of saying, I am taking a sabbatical from telling you who Jesus is. And I'm taking on a new thing to teach you how to evangelize the people. Because I've realized that in a day and age where we all have Bibles, we have 60 different versions, it's not my job to tell you who Jesus is. It's your job. Now, if we lived in a day where there was no Bible, if we lived in a day that I actually walked with the risen Christ and, and, and the Christ who died before and none of you had, I totally get it. I would spend my whole life to you revealing who Jesus is. But the fullness of the revelation of Jesus is in the word of God. And if you want revelation beyond that, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you through the word. I only get you for a very short time on Sunday. You have lots of time on your own to find out who Jesus is. And when you find out who Jesus is, you discover your identity. And that's it. Well, but I want to be my own person, my own personality. Well, sorry, um, join some false religion. Your identity is in Christ. I don't know what his personality was. I don't have like video recordings to see if, you know, he was a sarcastic guy or that kind of stuff. I'm not saying deviate from your personality, but if you, if you see yourself in any other way other than the person who has Christ on the inside of them and your job, whether you work in a secular job, you're a mom and dad or whatever, is to proclaim the kingdom and heal people and drive demons out, renew people's minds, all the things that Jesus did. That is your commission. It's just you're all in different spheres, different mountains, different circles in order to do that. Amen? So if I'm going to tell you from now on, I'm just going to teach you how to evangelize the people. If that scares some people off, like, well, I'm not coming back to this church. That's fine. There's lots of churches that are out there that will give you a lot of fluff and make you feel good. I don't want to feel good in these last days. I have love, joy, peace, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control all on the inside of me. I don't need anybody to make me feel good. Now, should we edify each other? And should this be a place where people tear each other down? No, of course not. But we should be motivating people. People think that Jesus was just this nice guy that's just like, I love everybody. You're all so great. I'm always wondering if I could have been there when they're like, hey, we brought this demon-possessed boy, and your disciples couldn't cast him out. I don't know a nice way to go, you faithless, perverse generation. How much longer should I stay with you? Bring him to me. I'm sure he probably had a little bit of a tone. Because we think that the Jesus of the Bible is just this really fluffy guy. When he called, I, I, you know, how do you say nicely? <laughs> you sons of serpents. <laughs> he called people brood of vipers. How do you tell somebody nicely that they're a hypocrite? It's not about, oh, well, he's just not very loving. He gave people the truth because if you are in hypocrisy and you need to change, someone who loves you would tell you. If you're about to be hit by a Mack truck, do you want somebody to go, well, I don't really want to tell them that they are too dumb that they're playing in the street and they're going to get hit by a car, so it's just better not to say anything. Boom! You don't love that person if you don't tell them that. Now, here's the thing. You've got to earn relationship with people and earn the right to speak into their life. Otherwise, it does come off as condemnation. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it is the last harvest. Go ahead and worship team, come on up. It is the last harvest. It is the last chance for us to do this. And again, I'm not a date setter. I'm just telling you that things are really ramping up. And I honestly do not want to get to heaven and have God tell me, hey man, great theology that you had at Seven Mountains Church. Your doctrine, beautiful. 
and then look at me and go, but where's all the people? Because that's the treasure in heaven, is the people you bring, not about the doctrine you kept. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then he, that was in plural, and then he made it singular. And this is my commandment, that you love others in the same way that I loved you. And it not it interesting that Jesus' entire mission was to get people to receive the kingdom whether it was through healing, deliverance, whatever the case may be, but it was to get them into the kingdom. If that was Jesus's mission, that should be our mission. Again, you can have all the discipleship you want. We offer things all throughout the week here at Seven Mountains. And like I said, you've got YouTube and podcasts and all kinds of stuff. My beloved, I'm saying this in love, feed yourselves. And when you're in your spheres, feed other people. Amen.